Hi there, grade 10s, and welcome to module one, where we are building on what we've already looked at in terms of software. We're now going to look at extended software concepts. Okay, so let's have a look at what we are going to look at. We're going to be going through what integrated software is, licensing agreements, free software, and system software. Now, please remember as we go through this, remember that when we talk about software, we are referring to a program that is performing a specific task. This can be a single program, a set of programs, a group of programs, anything like that. But just keep that in mind when you hear the term software. So the first thing we're going to look at is integrated software. Now, before the idea of graphical user interfaces, which we know are GUIs, programs looked very different to what they currently are. Okay, so it was hard to learn how to actually use new programs. And this is where integrated software comes into the equation because we're talking about uh, different pieces of software, or software that performs different functions, but they still have a similar look. Or in some cases, you actually buy them as one piece of software, like with Microsoft Office, and when it installs, it's got like three or four or five different programs in it. So the advantage of that is that your separate packages and think about Word, Excel and PowerPoint, they have a similar interface. Now, let's just go and look at this practically. Right? I'm going to bring up Word and then I'm going to look at Excel. And there you can see we have a similar layout. Do we have a ribbon in Word and in Excel? Yes. Do we have our autosave and our quick access buttons over there? Yes, we do. Do we have the name of the files? Yes. Do we have different tabs on top here? The content might be different, but the layout is the same. Um, what if I go into PowerPoint? PowerPoint's going to be the same. Do we see a similar layout? All right. So all of this, this is an, ex an example of integrated software because I buy this as one program, as one particular package. But yeah, you can see in that package, even though they are separate programs, they have a similar interface. Okay, so I hope that clears that one up. Separate packages designed to share and exchange data. So again, same with what I just showed you now. They are actually designed to share data between the different programs. And as you grow in your cat knowledge, you'll see how you can actually do that. They are sold as a suite of programs. In other words, it's one purchase. You are not buying three different packages. You're not buying five or four different packages. No, you are buying one. You install one file, one program. But in that, because we're talking about integrated, all of these are built into that one program. So now when it installs, you are buying one and it's actually installing separate packages for you. And this is why when we talk about the Microsoft Office suite, we are talking about a group of programs that perform different functions. Word is different to Excel, is different to PowerPoint, is different to Outlook, is different to Access, is different to Publisher, is different to your notes. Okay. Now, when you install programs like Microsoft Office, there's something called a license agreement or a licensing agreement. And here's a typical example of what it looks like. Now, let's be honest, nobody reads this, okay? But you need to just bear in mind the fact that these are legally binding contracts between you as the user, remember you are the one using the software, and the software company. So, if I'm going to be clicking on this OK button with the um, license uh, license terms, let's say for Microsoft Office, I'm actually signing a contract agreeing to how I am allowed to or not allowed to use their program. Yeah, they say these license agreements are often termed EULAs, and this is important for, for tests because this often comes up. What is an EULA? Explain what an EULA is. Maybe expand and explain this term. It's the end user license agreement. 
So you are allowed to install the software on your PC and maybe on another device, um, but this is where it really stops. So if you can, and I know people don't <laughs> read this, but you should look here, to a one copy per device, you may install one copy of the software on one device. That device is the licensed device, which means if you install it on more devices, um, you're performing an illegal action. Okay, just saying. Here you go again. Licensed device you may install and use on one copy. Portable device you may install another copy on a portable device for use by a single primary user of the licensed device. So there they stipulate exactly what you can and can't do with it. Okay, that's a license agreement. Here's another example, probably the longest one that's out there, which is um, from iTunes. Nobody reads this, like nobody reads this. This could be saying that they are going to come and collect you when you are 75 years old, um, or <laughs> something weird like that. What do most of us do? We just click agree. Just remember that this is a legally binding agreement between you as the user and the company that's created this piece of software, right? So you are agreeing to how you are going to be using their software. Now with this, a lot of people don't like these things. And with the age of the internet and everything being so available online, there is a lot of piracy that goes on. And when you think of piracy, yes, we think of our pirates. What does a pirate do? A pirate is going to be someone who is stealing things. Okay. So we're talking about stealing software. More so, it is the illegal installation, copying, and distributing of proprietary software. Now, please remember, when we talk about proprietary software, we're talking about software that is usually bought. Okay, there's a copyright on it. You have to actually buy the software. So when you get a copy of it, let's say from a friend, you make a copy, you distribute it, you install it, you are doing that all illegally. Okay, and you've you are committing software piracy. This is why most software now requires activating or registering it online in an attempt to crack down on this. And please remember that software piracy is a crime. There are fines involved and people do go to jail for this type of thing. Okay, so please do not do that. Here we go. There's our pirate sitting there with CDs and all types of things. Remember that when you buy software, when you buy Microsoft Office, you are sold a license to use it on your computer only. You are not the author of the software. Remember, you didn't create it, right? And therefore, you do not own the copyright. So you do not have the rights to go and take it and distribute it and send it. You don't have that right. So just understand that where software piracy is concerned. Now, you, you do get different types of licenses because let's just think logically. At your school, you might have a computer lab with 20, 30 PCs. You might have a school that's got 40 or 50 PCs in total, um, you know, teachers, PCs, admin, all this type of thing. Can you imagine if each one of them buy a license for each individual computer and each license costs like two or 3,000 Rand? That's going to add up to a lot of money. Okay, if you're just one user, that's fine. But you might have a multi-user or what we call a site license. So let's go into this a little bit. Firstly, we have our single user license. And this generally means that you may install, as we saw earlier, one copy of the software. You can also usually make one backup copy of the software to another form of media. That could be optical media like our CD and DVDs. It could be a flash drive, um, you know, external hard drive, anything like that. But here they're saying one copy on the machine to run and a backup copy somewhere else. Okay, so that's your single user license. Now, like I mentioned to you in the scenario, you take your school, for instance, they would make use of what is known as a site license. So what does this mean? Well, it's also a license, but here you are unrestricted to the number of installations that you can have within the company. Think of what happens at your computer lab in, in your school. Um, you'll have multiple PCs. The PC might break down. The software might need to be reinstalled. So when you buy a site license, 
you are purchasing one license, which is going to be more expensive than a single license, but it's cheaper than buying individual copies of the software for each PC. So you buy one copy and you can install it on as many pieces as you want to on that site. In other words, on that location. So within that school or within that organization. And that's the difference between a single user license and site license, um, also referred to as volume licensing. Okay. Now, we move on to two terms that always come up in tests. And by the way, the difference between these two, you need to know because those are things that come up, especially in scenarios. But this one comes up fairly regularly. The difference between freeware and shareware. And then we also talk about open source software. So again, just, just break up this term. This where refers to software. So we know this is a program. We know that this is a program. This one is completely free. This one is free for us to download, to use, to distribute, to do whatever we want to. It's fully functioning software, right? So it means it's the entire program that can be used and copied without any restrictions. Shareware, however, is slightly different. This is software that we can download for free and use for a trial period, right? This you must put in your answer when you are asked what is shareware. So we want to know that it's software that you can download for free, but you can only use it for a trial period, or you can use it for a specified period of time for free. After that, you'll have to pay for the full version. So please, this is most likely a two mark question. You need to say that you can download it for free and use it for a you know, period of time. Um, but to get the full version, you need to pay. So here are um, some examples. Here we've got our free software, again, free of charge, sorted out. We've got our freeware. Um, here are some examples of freeware, Skype and Adobe Acrobat. Um, under the free software and what we're going to talk about now, the open source software, we've got things like Linux, Ubuntu, MySQL and Apache. Um, please go and check for examples of these three. Know at least one example and one disadvantage and advantage of each one of these. Okay, also know how to define it. It is very important. It's something that comes up all the way through from grade 10 to grade 12. Then the last one that I spoke about is the open source software. Now, this is software that you can download for free. You can use it for free. You can distribute it, but it can be, and this is the interesting bit here, it can be modified. So in other words, you get not only the software, but you get the source code behind the software so that you can actually modify the program if you need to, right? As a result, it's not sold, right? People are not selling this stuff. Here are a few examples. Um, the Linux operating system used by many, many places, um, office suites like OpenOffice and LibreOffice. The only thing is that there are a few disadvantages with open source software in that there's not proper support because this is something that's freely downloaded and uh, modified and that you're not always sure of the correct version, etc. So yeah, just, just bear that in mind. Okay. And here are the disadvantages I'm talking about. No guarantee of the quality. Um, often many different versions of the same product. You can generally only get it from the internet. As a result, it's not as widely used. So please, when it comes to advantages and disadvantages of anything in CAD, you're looking at knowing at least two of them. Um, and that's all you really need. Right, then we go on to copyright. So what are we talking about? Well, copyright refers to the legal right to make copies, publish and sell. If you have the copyright to something, um, a piece of music, a piece of art, um, anything like that, that means that you have the legal right to make copies, publish and sell. This is why there's always fights uh, when it comes to music about copyright and this type of thing. Intellectual property is slightly broader. It recognizes the ownership of the person that came up with the original idea. Um, remember this whole thing that's going around now about the, uh, the guy who came up with the idea for the please call me? It's his intellectual property. He was working at Vodacom at the time, but they used his original idea. Um, and now they've got to pay up for that. So 
Just understand the difference between the copyright and the intellectual property. And then you have the Creative Commons. Now, the, this is basically a non-profit organization that promotes the sharing and free use of knowledge and products legally. And there's a whole website that, that deals with this. There are certain conditions, however, so you can use whatever's here for free, but they do request that you actually credit them um, or say exactly that, you know, you got it from the Creative Commons or you put the, the author's name or something like that in the picture or video or whatever it is that you um, are going to be using. Okay, so please, you must know the difference between these three. Then going on to system software. Now remember, our system software is a, it's going to refer to programs that manage the entire computer system. Of that, we get our utility programs. Our utility programs are what? Programs which perform general housekeeping on the computing device. And here you can see um, our folks sorting out the PC, checking everything, making sure everything is in order. This definition you must know, and you must know a few examples. Here's one. Compression software. Compression software is used to make a file or folder smaller. It does not damage the file or folder. It does not interfere with anything that, for example, with this Word document, it doesn't mess up any of the text inside or anything like that. It simply reduces the size. So here's a file and here's the zipped version or the compressed version of that file. You can then see the difference in terms of size over there. So please, compression software is one. Backup utilities is another one. At this stage, you should know what a backup is. Remember, a backup is creating a copy of whether it's files, folders, video, whatever the case is, um, to be kept safe somewhere else. So you are, you are making a copy of that data. Now, backing up our files regularly is essential. Think about your phone. If your phone gets stolen, you're not really worried about your phone. You're worried about what's on your phone. How do you replace the pictures? How do you replace the videos? If you have a backup of that, it won't really phase you. But why do we do this? Because files can be accidentally deleted. Files can become corrupt. Storage devices can fail. This is a typical question that comes up. Okay, so know not just what a backup is, but why we backup and know at least two reasons as to why we backup. So again, I'm going to say to you, our utility programs are programs which perform general housekeeping of the computing device. And we say computing device because it could be a laptop, it could be a desktop, it could be your smartphone, anything like that, they fall under the computing devices. Okay. Then carrying on with system software, we have our drivers. Now, when you plug a flash drive into a PC, you usually get some sort of sound and it tells you that it's picked up that there's a flash drive. If you plug in a printer, what's going to happen? It's going to pick up that there's some sort of printer and it wants to know what to do with it. So every piece of hardware from a flash drive to a printer is controlled by a driver. So what does this driver do? Well, a driver is a piece of software. In other words, it's a program. And what does this program do? It allows your computer to communicate with the hardware or devices. So we have the user over here. The user has the PC with the operating system and the device driver tells the operating system what this piece of hardware is and how to work with it. It tells it what this is and how to work with it what this is and how to work with it, what this is and how to work with it. Are you, are you getting my drift? Right? That is what your device driver does. It's a piece of software that allows the computer to communicate with hardware devices. Right. And folks, that is it for module 1.6.